Now let me welcome on to Top Dogs, a member of UConn's 2014 national title team, a seven-year pro in Europe and one of the most electric guards to come through the UConn program, none other than Ryan Boatwright. Boat, thanks for being here, man. Appreciate you. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So you are uh, you're in Paris right now. You're playing for Paris Basket uh, in the top mm-hmm. tier of the French Hoops League. Uh, it's not a bad way to make a living, man. How do you like Paris? Man, I, it's plenty uh, worse places to be. I can tell you that. Uh, you know, I love I love being in Paris. Um, you know, you can't ask for much more or a better city to live in to play basketball if you had to be in Europe. So, uh, you know, I'm very grateful to be able to have this opportunity. How how long have you been there? It's almost a year now, right? Yeah, yeah, almost a year this year. Um, I came um, at the end of the season, the last season. I came for the last three months, and then I signed another deal for this year. So, Have you had a chance to to go out and like experience the city at all, or has it been shut yeah, down? Yeah, this year, this, this time around since I've been here in August, um, it was it was back open. When I came at the end of the season last year, it was still quarantine. Everything was locked down, so I didn't really get the experience, but. Since I've been here since August, I've, I've been been able to get out and, and see some things. So I, I want to make sure that I put into context for people listening to this how good that, that French league is. Uh, Mike James, who played for the Nets last year, he plays mm-hmm. for Monaco, I believe, right? Yeah. Scotty yeah. Reynolds. Any Big East fan is going to know who Scotty Reynolds is. He's playing. Right. Yeah. Um, there's probably a dozen former McDonald's All-Americans that are playing in the, the – what is it, the L? Is it the LBN? Is that – LNB. LNB, yeah. So, it, I mean, it's no joke there. It's a good league. Oh yeah, no, it ain't. It ain't sweet by <laughs> by no means at all. Um, you know, you can run into, you know, a former All American like Scotty Reynolds was an AP All American at at Villanova. You know what I mean? Mike James is probably the best guard in Europe right now. People would say so. You know, you 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 get especially at the point guard position. Um, you know, you can have a tough matchup every every night. So one guy I do need to hit you on is uh, I hope I don't butcher this name Victor Wembenyama. He's uh, yeah. the the seven foot two wing. He's uh, seventeen years old, I guess. Potential number one pick in the twenty twenty three draft. He plays for is it at Aceville? Asville. That's uh, Tony Asville. Parker. Yeah. How long did it take you to, to get all these pronunciations down? Because I'm not I don't that. really be trying to pronounce them. To be honest with you, I just explain it like I, like if I was talking about him, I'd be like the young kid, the seven footer, play for Tony Parker team. You know, that's right. that's how right. so the, the the seven footer that played for Tony's Parker's team. Uh yeah. give me a scouting report on him. Is is he the real deal? Is he worth the hype? Yeah, yeah, he's a real deal, man. He's a he's a very good player. Uh obviously he's young, you know, he got some things to learn, but as far as the you know, the physical attributes, he has it all and the skill the skill level. Um is his potential is extremely high. You know, you can't teach height. Um he's a seven two guy that can put it on the floor, he can shoot the ball. Um, you know, he's long, he block shots, and he's a, he's a young kid. So, you know, once he gets on a NBA program and an NBA, NBA um, you know, protein program and they put that weight on him, he's going to be, he's going to be, a, he's going to be trouble. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say he's a, uh, he, he's seven foot two, but he probably weighs what, like 180 pounds yeah, or something like that. Yeah, definitely. He's, he's really skinny, but you know, he's, he's tough. Um, he's wiry strong. So, you know, he, he can hold his own out there. So as with most guys that, that play in Europe, you've kind of bounced around a little bit. I mean, it mm-hmm. seems like that's just kind of how it goes uh, when you're mm-hmm. playing over there. Where was your uh, favorite place to play? What was the best city that you played in? <sighs> to be honest here, um, so far, I mean, uh, my most successful um, uh, stat-wise, you would say, uh, would have to have been in Croatia with uh, Vita, um my first time around. I played for them twice. Uh, that was what 16, no, 17, 2017. Uh, I had a lot of fun pl- uh, living in Istanbul. Um, when I played for Besitash, I, I, I like the city of Istanbul a lot. Um, but all around, just one a whole total package as far as the the, the organization and the city, um, it would have to be here. You know, because you know, a lot of times you have one or the other. You know, you can really like the organization and the basketball thing, you know, could be going well for you, but you could be miserable living in a born a born city in the middle of nowhere, you know, or you could be living in, you know, like I played in Malaga, which is like this the, oh, the yeah. Miami thing, you know, but my basketball situation wasn't the best. So, you know, just trying to find 
that balance of both of those is hard. And once you do, you try to stick there for a long time. So, um, yeah, we, uh, just, I, I did yeah. part of my honeymoon was in Marbella with, and so oh, well, down there on like, you, man, you know how, was, yeah, you know so how insane. nice it is. Exactly. You know how nice it is. So, you know, my basketball situation would have, would have been how, how I wanted it in that situation. You know, I probably would have tried to finish my career there. Yeah. But, <laughs> it's not bad when you're living on the beaches in Spain. I'll tell you that. Much exactly. <laughs> uh, all right. So, uh, Luke Hancock once told me a story about playing in Turkey when he heard uh, bombs going off outside of the locker room uh, during halftime. Uh, another guy told me when he was playing for uh, Partizan in Belgrade that yeah. they would get pelted with lighters every time they played anywhere on the road. So I need your craziest story from playing European basketball. I know you got uh, some good ones. I got a lot. I mean, from both of those plays, I get one of each. Uh, Turkey, uh, we was warming up. Um, we, we had a road game, you know, I didn't, I was new to being in Turkey and I didn't really know the rivalries and stuff like that. And we had a game in Gaziantep and I remember, uh, warming up and we doing layup lines and I hear like, I don't know if you familiar with the term, the M80, the firecracker, the <laughs> bro, all I hear is a big boom, right? And a bunch of smoke right behind the basket. Like the crowd is going crazy right behind the basket. And then right after that, I'm talking about full blown riot. Like at least seven, 800 people literally fighting right behind our basket. And we looking around like, yo, is this really going on right now? Like smoke everywhere, chairs being thrown, all that type of stuff, bro. Like it was crazy. That was my first fight experience. Um, but the craziest experience for your, me, your first, first one, that's when you know it's wild. When it was your first fight experience. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then I love personally, I love playing partisan, you know, partisan and, and, and red star are in the same city. They play in the same arena, but it's two different clubs. So the city is split down the middle. You have partisan fans and you have red star fans. Me personally, I never played for those teams, but I've always played against them and I love playing there. You know, the hostility is crazy. Like, they probably got the craziest fans I've ever seen. Man. Like, whoever told you that about the lighters and stuff, that's a real thing. Like, I've been hit with lighters, quarters. You know, the $2 bills over here is, like, big round, you know, big round quarters. I've been hit with those. Like, it's crazy, but it's an amazing place to play the game of basketball, man, because it brings the best out of it. Yeah, people so, think that that student sections in college basketball are crazy. Like you need to see yeah. what these these club basketball what... teams are about <laughs> yeah. in Europe. There's no there's exactly. no rules. There's no rules. There's no, no rules. No rules, bro. And you know, in America, you worried about going to jail and you know, police getting you over here. Yeah, they not worried about it at all. The cops yeah, are the I'm... ones throwing the lighters at you. Exactly. <laughs> it's crazy, man. All right, enough enough of your old chatter. Let's talk about UConn here. That's why we got you on this podcast. So. Uh, you got there in 2011, which was right after Kemba won the national mm -hmm. title. Um, what what led to that decision to pick UConn? Was was it seeing what he did? Um, was it Jim Calhoun? Was it the the history of point cards? Like what what was it about UConn that made you commit? To A little bit of all of it. Um, I was committed there before we before Kemba did what he did. You know what I mean? So uh, that was just icing on the cake for me coming in. But um, growing up as a kid, I always you know, like, like UConn, like I always watched UConn. They was always on, you know, primetime TV. It was always on ESPN, um, big time game, game uh, Mondays and stuff like that. And then just as I got older and understood the game of basketball um, and not just being a fan of it, he always, Coach Calhoun was a great coach and he always played two small guards mm -hmm. at one time, if they deserved to be on the floor. And going into UConn um, or going into college, wherever I went, I wanted to play. You know, I had never rolled the bench before. And you hear those stories about freshmen coming in, they don't really play this and that. And I just, I didn't want that to be me. You know what I mean? So I just wanted to go somewhere where I had the opportunity to prove myself. And if I could, he would, he would allow me to play. You know, because you go, you got some guys that go to some school and you know, some coaches just don't believe in playing freshmen. You know, it don't matter if they better or they deserve the time. They just don't get on the floor. So uh, with my understanding of knowing that he did, he he does that and he did that. Um, when I had committed to West Virginia, Coach Calhoun and UConn was going through whatever NCAA regulations they were going through at the time. So they really couldn't full on recruit. 
you know, as soon as I decommitted from West Virginia, it was like it all worked out perfectly. So literally the next day after I decommitted, whatever sanctions or whatever they had going on opened up and they could recruit again. So it all worked out at the perfect, like the perfect time. And then uh, once that happened, I took my last visit to UConn, uh, went down there, um, had an amazing time, got to see Kimball work out, got to see their first uh, two days of practice. Um, Shabazz and uh, Oriaki was my was my host. And I just had an amazing time, man. I felt like I could go there and, and, and be successful and, um, you know, become a great basketball player and a great and a great man. Because KO was the assistant coach. He was the guard coach mm-hmm. when I was coming in. So um, having him playing for OKC the year before that, and, you know, me wanting to be a point guard in the NBA, it just was the whole total pack. Man. And it all worked out for the best. So Shabazz was your host. Was uh, Can you share any of the stories from uh, from your recruiting visit there? Uh, I mean, Shabazz, Shabazz was supposed to be my host, but it was like a mixture of all of them. You know, like you're supposed to get assigned to one person. He's supposed to show you everything. But at UConn, when I went up there, I was like passed around a little bit. You know what I mean? Um, I was with Bass for a little while. We Bass is a big uh, game, you know. Um, we were just playing 2K and playing video games and stuff like that and just talking. And I was picking his brain about the run. And, and how he was, you know, able to come in as a freshman and play right away and stuff like that. And then uh, when, the, when the nighttime came around we, and we went to go out, I was with Oriaki and Roscoe Smith. And um, that's, you know, I don't keep those stories to myself. But <laughs> had an amazing time, you know what I mean? <laughs> Alex I Oriaki. You is, did, man. You committed, so. Yeah, you, you know what I mean? So Oriaki is one of my best friends to this day, along with Shabazz and um, you know, I just had a great time. You know, Kimball was, you know, he was he was Kimball. He was big dog. So, you know, I got to kick it with him and, and, and pick his brain, but he wasn't really, you know, yeah. he was off his own thing. Yeah, he, was he, was getting, he was getting ready for the next level at that point. Exactly. Right? So you you walked into the team as a freshman and you I think what you missed like the first was it eight games or something like that? And then you yeah, had to find uh, a way to earn your like you had to find a way to earn minutes as a freshman on a team coming off of winning a national title. Like what is that? What is that experience like? How difficult was it to kind of work your way into that rotation? It was, it was, it was really difficult. Um, you know, if it, if it wasn't for how I grew up and where I come from, and um, you know, just the way that my family and my mom raised me uh, to just be a fighter, you know, just have a lot of heart and just whatever it is, just get through it. I don't think I would have did it because Shabazz was not going. You know, Shabazz is a a hell of a player. You know, what I mean, one of the best players I ever laced him up with right. and he didn't take it lightly at all like he was trying to embarrass me and kill me every day you know what I mean like every chance he got he was trying to take it at me and um you know I just responded you know I just wasn't somebody that that backed down and um you know got scared and folded up you know I went right back at him and I used that to to get better every day and then when I got when I had my situation with NCAA and I couldn't uh, travel, you know, I just used that time to really get in the gym and get some, get some uh, one-on-one, one-on-one work in, like a lot of individuals and stuff like that, a lot of extra shooting late at night and stuff like that. And it just was like, man, when I get my opportunity and they finally allow me to play, I'm going to make sure that I'm ready. And uh, I think Coach Calhoun seen that. Um, and then also one thing that I had to do was the defensive end. Like I knew that we had Jeremy Lamb, Shabazz, you know, Andre Drummond and all those guys that was, you know, was going to score the ball. You know what I mean? So I was like, what can I do that everybody else ain't doing that could show Coach Cal like he needs to be on the floor? And that was picking up, you know, full court. And um, I think once Coach Cal seen me willing to do that and play defense like that, I think that's what bought me, you know, those first couple minutes and his, his first trust. And then once I got on the floor, you know, my offensive talents, naturally just you know took over in the spots where I needed and it all worked out I think I ended up playing like 30 minutes as a freshman yeah you average seven points a game coming out yeah um I I do want to ask you this so that team was a preseason like preseason top five after um after Andre committed right like that was that was that was a while it was like late August he decided to go to school instead of going to prep schools I forget the exact details but um but then you guys kind of 
never really got it going, right? I think you finished as a like an eight or nine seed, ended up losing to Iowa State in the tournament. Um, mm -hmm. And you come back next year and you find out that you're going to be banned from the NCAA tournament. So why did you stay? Like, I, I feel like that's that, that would have been a very easy situation to kind of say, well, hey, look, you know what? This isn't working. I want to play in the tournament. Why, why, why didn't you leave? I feel like that nowadays a lot of kids probably would have transferred out of the program. Yeah. I mean, a lot of uh, – I'm just a loyal guy, man. Like, that's just – it's in my DNA, like, you know, once I commit to something um, and, you know, that's what I want to do. I don't break camp when things get tough. You know what I mean? I don't, I don't jump ship when things get tough. And, um, you know, I seen, you know, that's what guys were doing. Not saying that guys didn't make the right decision for their own careers. You know, I was young. You know, I was a sophomore. I still had, I still had time. There was some guys that was there that that would have been their last year, you know, so they needed to move on so they could try to get in the tournament they last year, you know, try to make their dreams come true. So I don't fault anybody, but me personally, I was like, I'm gonna stick this out, you know, where you count on my chest, you know, come every day pre um, prepared to hoop. And when we get that chance again, you know, we gonna, we gonna make a statement. And, um, you know, that's what we did, man. Uh, and, and then just as in today, it was totally different. You know, when you transferred back then, you had to sit a year. Mm -hmm. now these kids can tra transfer and play right away so it's a little it's a little easier decision to you know to, to transfer so you think you would have um, left like if you were playing in college right now you think you would have left you would have stayed I think it would have it would have it would have made my decision a little harder but I think me personally uh, like I said I'm, I'm just a loyal guy you know what I mean I think I would have uh, considered it being able to play right away but me being me I just know I probably would have stuck it out like I did before um, you know, I love, and I love UConn, you know what I mean? I love being up there. You know, I love the the fans. We got the best fans in America. And, um, you know, I just, I, I wouldn't want to be a part of no other university. So college basketball is all about that build to March, right? You, you got the non-conference season and then you got the start of the league play and then you get into the conference tournament and it's all built building. It's like a crescendo building towards selection Sunday and playing in the NCAA tournament. And you guys didn't have that. So how, how difficult is a college basketball season? How difficult is it to stay focused when you know you're not going to have that reward at the end? It's extremely hard. I'm not going to lie. Uh, not even just being able to play in the NCAA tournament. You know, we we couldn't play in the Big East tournament. You know, in the when it was the real Big East, my first two years, you know, the Big East tournament was almost just as good as the NCAA tournament. You know, you had Madison Square Garden. You got you know, these real UConn's big third we, home. Make, you got to make sure you reference that. You can't exactly third home. You know what I mean. So, like, it's an unbelievable feeling playing in Madison Square Garden. So, just not being able to do that, knowing that all year, it was tough. But at the same time, um, you know, we had a bunch of guys on our team that was just really, really, really prideful. Like, you know, we was like, okay, we know we're not going to be able to go to the tournament, but we still got to lace them up and get out here. And, and play the game of basketball and everybody's watching us. We still got UConn on our chest. We still a target. We still a big team and people want to embarrass us. And we wasn't going for that. You know what I mean? So we was like, look, we're going to go out here. We're going to compete. We're going to try to win every game we can and let it, and let everybody know if we could go to this tournament, we this would be a team that will make some real noise. You know what I mean? And that's yep. what we did. All right. So uh, we got to talk about 2014. We got to talk about the title team, obviously. Um, I'm I'm a UConn fan, right? And I remember watching that team throughout the season, being like, "Hey, man, they're good. Like, I could see them getting to the second weekend. I could see them making a run of the Big East tournament." But I don't think there was ever a point during the year where I, where I was like, "Oh yeah, they're gonna they, they could win six games in March. Like, they can go cut down the nets um, in Dallas." So when did when did you guys kind of have that moment where it clicked and you were like, "Okay, you know what? We're we're good enough to be able to make this run." Was there ever a moment, or was it just kind of like? You're playing it game by game and like, right, let's see if we, we can beat these guys. We always knew that we had the potential to, to win it all. Uh, we knew that we had all of the pieces um, to, to, to take it all the way. Um, I think that we had that first scare with St. Joe's. Mm -hmm. And once we got past that, once we got past St. Joe's, I think um, a little pressure eased up off of us. You know, it's hard. It's, it's just getting out of that first game. And once we got out of that first game and we got up and we matched up against Nova, we was confident going into the Villanova game. You know, we, we, we was extremely confident, to be honest. We knew we kind of felt like we was going to win that game. And then we was like, look, we get out of this first weekend, we going back home. 
you know, if we're going back to our third home, we that, that sectional or that semi final was in Madison Square Garden, and we was like, look, we go there, anything can happen. Yeah. Went into that game, man, it was uh, it was loud in there. That, there were man. UConn fans. I uh, Michigan State. I remember the the I was at that game. I'm and I remember yeah. the lead eight game. Um, and there was a uh, like a, a run where Shabazz hit a three. Then you got to yeah. stop, and Niels came down and had like a dunk, a dunk. in yeah. transition, and like that was about as loud as I've ever heard the Garden when UConn was yeah. playing there. I was like, they're a seven seed. How did it this happen? Crazy. It was crazy in there, man. Um, unbelievable experience, bro. It was, it was, it was nuts in there. But uh, yeah, going into that game, we we took care of business with Iowa State, and um, personally, I remember going into the Michigan State game, and I remember uh, watching the the. I don't know the name of the show, but it was Charles Barkley, Shaq, Kenny Smith, Ernie, all those guys, right? And nobody just believed in us, man. Like everybody thought Michigan State was just finna, just finna punk us like that. Like, and we, we, and me and Shabazz used to be watching it together. Like, yo, is these, these people crazy? Like they don't know who we is, huh? And I remember Charles Barkley talking mad junk, like talking so much trash. And I was, I can't wait for this game tomorrow, bro. And me and Baz was like, bro, we finna go out here, just wreck havoc. And um, that's what we did, man. We had a, I think DeAndre had a good game. We all, everybody played well that game. But we knew that we could make history by winning, just taking care of business tonight in our third home. And we go down to Dallas and let the chips fall where they may. What, what was, what we, was there, was there value in, in, in Baz being on that team that had won the title previously? Because it, it was kind of the same situation with that group, right? Like I think, in 2011, they lost four of their last five heading into the Big East tournament. They were a nine seed. And they played yeah. the first day of the big, the first game of the first day. You know yeah. those games on the Tuesday afternoon when there's nobody mm-hmm. in Madison Square Garden? Like, you can't play in that game. And they went mm-hmm. on to win the Big East title and the, uh, the NCAA tournament in 2011. Yeah. So what, what did, was, was there value in having a guy that kind of went through that already on a roster? Yeah, I mean, just having the value of having him on our team – all around the board was was a tremendous help for us. Um, just as far as being a leader, having that experience with the 2011 team, um, you know, uh, his scoring ability was amazing. Um, being able to be a playmaker um, and just us feeding off of him um, throughout the game was just, you know, it was top tier, man. You know, Shabazz is a great player. Um, you know, one of the best guys to ever put on a UConn jersey. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was it was a tremendous uh, experience with having them on our team. All right, so take me through you guys. You guys knock off Kentucky. You win the national title. You cut down the nets. Take me through that post game celebration. What do you remember from it? What do you remember from uh, going into the locker room? What do you remember from getting back to the team hotel? Well, well give me give me some uh, post title stories. I remember going to getting in the locker room and uh, everybody just you know the 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 they got the the stuff all up on the lockers and stuff for the, the champagne or whatever the case may be. Um, and I remember seeing all of the alumni in there, Ray Allen, Rip Hamilton, you know, all of those guys, Kimba and them. I think the Kimba was Kimba there. I think a lot of guys had flew down, Jeremy Lamb, all of them had took a jet down um, from wherever they was at and came down for the night. And I just remember going in there and everybody jumping around, and, you know, just screaming and taking pictures and, it was just a crazy experience. I remember Coach Miller, our assistant coach, dancing and everybody getting that on, on, on camera. Um, and then I remember my family was there. We, we, took the, we took the bus back. And you know how hard it is to get back into the hotel lobby. Oh, yeah. After winning a national championship, it was a million fans in the lobby. You take a million pictures, kissing babies and all type of stuff. <laughs> um, I finally get back uh, to my family. And, and I brought up that story before because, uh, you know, I was really close with Derrick Rose and, and, and his older brother, Reggie Rose. And Reggie came down for the game and um, just gave him a, a big hug, man, because he was my AAU coach. And we used to talk about these things. I used to ask him, you know, the experience of being at the national, uh, being in the national championship game with Derrick playing in Memphis and Kansas and stuff like that. And I remember being a kid, 16, and he telling me these things and for me to, for him to be here and me experiencing those exact same things that I was asking him about, it was just kind of surreal. And um, I remember my grandfather, um, remember when I told you I was watching Charles Barkley talking jump, and I remember telling my grandpa, 
like, man, Charles Barkley think we sweet, Pop. Like, this man crazy, right? And uh, Charles Barkley was at the hotel, at the bar, having drinks. And I remember my grandfather going up to him, and I don't remember exactly what he said. I don't want to make it up, but, you know, I got to meet Charles Barkley, and he was just like, hey, man, it was just my opinion. Y'all guys proved me wrong. Woo, woo, congratulations. And, um, you know, that was a great experience also. Uh, and that, after that, I that felt good saying that to him, huh? Yeah, I like, hey, Remember amazing. when you thought we were going to lose to Michigan State? How about yeah, that? felt amazing. And um, <laughs> after that, it was pretty much a blur, man. Uh, we went out. You know, that night, we I remember coming in from going out straight to the bus, like literally straight to the bus. Um, and then we flew back, and I remember driving in from UConn. If you ever been to stores, you know, it's one long highway up to mm-hmm. campus. And uh, I remember just thousands of fans being lined up along the street, man, all the way up to campus. Um, signs, they jumping around, cheering. And we finally got to campus, and it was just crazy. It was mayhem on campus. Um, kids, did you, did you see the interview that that uh, the Georgia quarterback Stetson Bennett had on the Today Show after Georgia won the the national title this year? I didn't see it. He no, showed up half it. asleep. It looked like yeah. he uh, he was slurring his words a little bit. That was, that was Ryan Boatwright on the bus, right? Was that Ryan Boatwright Absolute, playing right home? Absolutely, man. That was all the buzz, bro. We had an amazing time. Um, in Dallas for those few hours, but honestly, we all couldn't wait to get back to campus. Mm-hmm. That's always about we can't wait to get back to campus. Like, and then you know the girls had one the next night, mm-hmm. so it was just crazy. Like, I remember seeing videos. People, the kid, the, the students had like they was flipping cars and burning couches and <laughs> just going crazy on campus. We was like, man, we can't wait to get back to campus. And um, they had a, I forgot what it's called, but it was a Bunch of people in the, um, in Gamble, um, the podium was set up and all that. And we came in, KO spoke, and then they revealed Shabazz um, being in the Huskies of Honor. So that was a great experience. I'm glad I got to share that with him because he definitely deserved it. And, um, you know, I don't think I slept for the next two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to celebrate it, man. Yeah, I don't think I slept for the next two weeks. When you go back to Connecticut, do people recognize you? Like, if you walk into um, someplace on campus, is everyone going to be like, oh, that's that's Ryan Boatwright over there. Look at that. Um, unfortunately, uh, I haven't been able to get back to campus during school. You know, I've been overseas. You know what I mean? And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, when, you know, if you know UConn, you know, nobody's there in the summertime besides the athletes that have to be there and, you know, the, some of the staff. But there's no students, nothing like that. So, I haven't been able to go back, catch a game, or be there and watch schools in. Um, can't wait till I can, um, but unfortunately, I haven't been able to. I did go back last summer uh, to check out the guys and meet the team and meet. Well, I had already met uh, the staff, Kamani and them, from being at Coach Cow's alumni game a few years ago. Um, but I just felt like I needed to touch back in and touch 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 bases with the guys and um, got a chance to meet some of the players and stuff like that. So. Um, I did go out in Hartford, not go out, but I was out in Hartford in a couple of restaurants and stuff like that. And the people recognized me. So uh, that was my first time being back since I left. So um, it was a good experience. People still, you know, recognize my face. You know, I didn't have all the beard and stuff like that back then. So um, it, it's probably a little different, but it was good to know that people still recognize me. But I can't hopefully, wait to be. Able- hopefully they didn't let you buy your own dinner. You won a national title. I did buy my own dinner, but uh, they gave me a few free free, free drinks, though. There they you go. Did. That's that that that's good enough. That's good enough. All right. Yeah. Um, how much have you watched this year's team? Have you seen them play at all? Um, I haven't seen a full uh like live game, but I, I check out all of the highlights. I check the stats when I wake up in the morning. I check to see if they won or not and see who played well. But it's hard catching them. It's the, uh, yeah, actual. It's the, the the time difference is tough. Yeah. The time difference is crazy, and you know our our schedule is crazy also. So I can't be staying up to four or five in the morning trying to watch a game. Yeah, just wait. They're they're, they're good. They make yeah. the final four. I better see you down there. Oh, I'm there. <laughs> I'm there. I'm gonna talk to my coach and them like, yo, I need a I need a jet or something, man. Like, <laughs> I got to make and, this game. And it's in New Orleans too this year, so. Yeah, I'm there. I'm. I'm might, might, get, might get a little reckless. We're gonna have to see uh see 22 year old Ryan Boatwright come back out. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> All right, man, I got I got three more quick hitters to wrap this thing up for you. So uh, everybody listening to this knows how crazy Jim Calhoun can be. So I need your 
wildest Jim Calhoun story? I know you got a lot of good ones. Oh, man, I got a lot. Uh, coach was crazy, man. I ain't, I, crazy, but he's an amazing coach. Like, Hall of Fame coach. Love Coach Cal. Um, I don't know, man. Like, keeping it, you know, I know kids probably watching this. Uh, Cal, I don't want to say you too don't, much. You don't, have to, you don't have to keep it PG. You don't have to keep yeah, it PG. Uh, it, it something good. I remember, I remember, uh, <laughs> Coach uh, Alex Oriaki, right? So I, I don't know if he, if y'all know Alex. And Alex is really like goofy. You know, he his physical stature is tough guy. Like I'm, I'm, I'm swole and I got the tattoos, but he's a big teddy bear. You know what I'm saying? So this dude Alex, man, I remember me and Shabazz, we used to go at it so crazy in practice, and um, we used to talk trash or whatever. And um, coach got tired of us talking, and we all we both used to always like like foul here, foul here, like call, call fouls. And coach told us, "Look, shut shut the fuck up, like stop calling fouls, just play." I'm tired of both of you, right? And um, he was like, "The next one of y'all say something, practice is over, right?" So anyway, long story short, I forgot how it happened. Coach kicks us out of practice, right? And Alex. <laughs> Alex, Alex is walking as we as we as he kicks us out. And um, if you know Alex, he like walks on his toes, right? Like <laughs> he like leans side to side. And Coach says, "Alex, stop fucking walking and run your big ass out of my gym, right?" And Alex just, I don't. It's, it, it was funny in the moment, but the way he walks, I'm talking about he darts darts out of practice. And coaches just laughing, like, look at this dumbass. Like, coaches used to talk to us like he was one of us. You know what I'm saying? Like, he cuss you out in front of everybody. He embarrass you. Another one is he, uh, me and Tyler had a miscommunication in the game my freshman year, uh, playing against Marquette. And he thought that I was trying to show Tyler up, but I was telling him that me and Tyler just had a miscommunication with the defensive scheme or whatever, right? So I'm like, damn, like I know he is gonna like chew me out when I get to the to the to the sideline. He meets me at half court, bro. And I just see him standing there. You know how coach used to put his hands on his hips and do this. And I'm like, damn, this is ESPN. I'm talking about he meets me literally in the middle of the, the husky dog and just chews me out. I could probably pull the picture up right now on Google and he's spitting all in my face. I'm like, damn, coach, like, I'm wiping the spit off my face. Like, man, my mom watching this, bro. Like, <laughs> can't be talking to me like this, dude. But he's a great coach, man, and even even better person. I've seen players, uh, you know, from way back, from 01, 02, come back and, you know, they be having whatever situation they got going on in their life and they want to finish school and stuff like that. And coach looks out for them, gives them a place to stay you know, get them back in school, whatever the case may be, get them a job while they're there. So, you know, he truly loves his players and loves the program. So he's an yeah. amazing person. All right. Give me your uh, your toughest road environment that you played in when you were in college. Mm. Had to be in Louisville. Louisville? Louisville was tough, man. Like we, I could not – we could not beat them, bro. Like, no matter how good we was playing, whatever the case may be, we cannot beat them dudes, man. And uh, I remember before we won a national championship, our last regular season game, we had Louisville at Louisville. And I think they beat us by like 35. Yeah. Just just destroyed us. Man, I couldn't hear, couldn't hear each other talk. We couldn't hear, could call the plays, nothing. Like crazy environment and a um, really good team. And another one that probably had to be my sophomore year at Pittsburgh. Uh, that was that was crazy too. That was a they long time it. ago for Pitt. Yeah, a long time ago for Pitt. <laughs> they used to call it the zoo or something like that. And yep. it was it was crazy. Sure. Yep. All right. Last one I got for you. I need your all time UConn starting five. <sighs> Put you Dang. on the spot with this one. You better have yeah. Shabazz starting at the point, man. <laughs> all, all this you talking about Shabazz. You know, I just had to, I had the, I had the opportunity to play with him, you know what I mean? So I just, you know, I, I, I appreciate, you know, 
the greatness when I, when I see it. I give guys their flowers, but I cannot put Baz over Kimba, and I think he understand that. <laughs> so uh, Kimba at the one. I would have to go Ray Allen at the two. Mm. Ray Allen at the two. Rip Hamilton at the three. Uh, I mean, political wise, I, you would have to put Diane Marshall at the four. You know, mm-hmm. but I, I honestly didn't get to see Diane Marshall at UConn, so I'm gonna go with Rudy Gay at the four. Rudy's my man, and at the five, it would have to be toss up between the Mecca Okafor and um, uh, Hashim the beat. I think you got to go Mecca. Yeah. I love Hashim. I think you got to go Mecca. Yeah, Mecca Mac was Mecca was a his problem. junior year. His junior year was different. Yeah, Rip and Ray is my guys. Don't get me wrong, but I'm a huge Ben Gordon fan. Yep. Ben Gordon was the truth at UConn, but yes, he was. I can't. I can't put him over Rip and Ray. Yeah, it's hard, man. You got two Hall of Famers there. Yeah, for sure. Two Hall of Famers. It tells PG you how good that program was, though. Absolutely. What you got to decide between. Absolutely. So, listen, Bo, I appreciate the time, man. Thank you for being here. Best of luck the rest of your season. And hopefully, hopefully, we're going to be catching up in New Orleans pretty soon. Yeah. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. And uh, I pray that I do get to see you. Man.